Unitarian Universalists have a habit of pointing to the summer as proof that we can be good, moral people without religion. <laughs> During the summer's hiatus from the rigors of worship, we have managed to stay out of trouble, mostly, exercise decency, and continue to live our lives well. And thus, this strange notion has evolved that Unitarians believe that they are the only people that God trusts to take the summer off. <laughs> In fact, have you noticed how much stricter God is with those evangelicals? <laughs> it's got to tell you something. An old colleague of mine, the Reverend Charlie Slap, confessed that the Unitarian tradition of closing the doors through the summer seems a little over the top. And he came to this conclusion when many years ago, he called the Unitarian Church to get in touch with someone in particular. And the recorded message on the church phone literally ran like this. This church is closed for the summer. If you are one of those people who actually need a church during the summer, try the Presbyterians. <laughs> That's too much, man. That's just too much. <laughs> Fortunately, our church doors are open all year long. I don't think we're particularly needy, and I have the utmost respect for Presbyterians. But it sure is nice to keep the spiritual waters of this caring community flowing throughout the year, including the summer. We were privileged this summer in hearing a full slate of provocative and inspirational, stimulating speakers, and we owe a large debt of gratitude to our summer forum director, the Reverend Harold Strawn. Harold, thank you so very much. A great program. People wanted to go to church in the summer. I don't know how you pulled that off. Yeah. <laughs> also want to be grateful and, and share some gratitude to Lee Schuster, who made sure that we were able to hear what the summer forum speakers were saying. <laughs> but now with school resuming and the lemonade stands folding up, and a hint of autumn in the air as work routines fall back into place. We return to First Church a bit rested, I hope, and also receptive to another year of what we do best around here, to examine carefully the things that matter most in life. <clears throat> and as a religious community, diverse though we may be, we all support the principles that guide us through this often messy life of ours. Guides us through with integrity, compassion, giving voice to justice and the inherent dignity and worth of all people. We actually follow the same prescription recommended by William Ellery Channing in an 1824 sermon when he declared that liberal religious convictions must be expressed fervently, poetically, and with the freshness of imaginations. And he also added three other requirements for religious liberals. One, skepticism about religious conventions. Two, a willingness to be controversial. And three, a commitment to reform society. I think Channing would be very pleased with this congregation, praising our fervor in reforming society and our fearlessness in the face of controversy. Our level of religious skepticism has always been pretty high around here. 
Irenaeus, the great early church father, said that the glory of God is a human being fully alive. And if you back off from all things controversial, you are not alive. And what is worse, you're boring. <laughs> Boredom has never really been an issue for this congregation, although sometimes I do wish we were a little less boring. <clears throat> the summer, now virtually over, was filled with controversy. It demonstrated to me yet again the extent of reform that needs to take place and the stunning measures of injustice that plague the hearts of far too many. Since our year-ending church picnic in June, our society has undergone some seismic shifts in dealing with wedge issues that continue to divide us as a nation. And I want to take a few minutes this morning to evaluate these bothersome issues, the summer wedgies that get bunched up and make us feel uncomfortable. The Supreme Court delivered some decisions early on, a mixed bag of rights denied and rights restored, depending from where your oppression stems. It was a good summer for the LGBT community, mirroring a broader acceptance in our culture of homosexuality. Besides, nobody wants to be identified with Vladimir Putin. <laughs> so all of a sudden, we become pretty tolerant. Even the Pope exclaimed the most beautiful five words ever strung together, who am I to judge? And Pope Benedict, if you remember, began the summer with accusations of a gay lobby in the Vatican, but ended the summer with this profound humility not to judge others. Let's just say it's been a hell of a growing experience for the Pope this summer. <laughs> but while the US Supreme Court invalidated the Defense of Marriage Act, which denied benefits to same-sex couples legally married in their states, and the court also would not rule on the challenge to Proposition 8, thus allowing California to resume handing out marriage licenses to same-sex couples. The Supreme Court struck down key provisions in the Voting Rights Act of 1965 with the effect of proclaiming somehow that racism was now over in America. With newly imposed ID, voter ID laws to stop people from voting, well, at least to stop Democrats from voting. <laughs> Racism has once again spewed its ugly side in state legislatures, bringing the whole question of equality, and justice, and democracy under fierce scrutiny. After all these years, I have a hard time conceiving of race becoming a wedge issue once again. I cried twice this summer. First, when the news hit that 19 young firefighters, the Granite Mountain hotshots of Prescott, Arizona, died while battling the Yamal Hill fire. The tears hit me by surprise, knowing full well the risks that always accompany firefighters. Perhaps it was because I was in Prescott just um, last April, and it has to be the most open and friendly town I've ever experienced. You can't go, you can't go anywhere, whether it be a, a restaurant, whether it be a, an art exhibit, without people just engaging you in conversation. It is, it is just a wonderful, wonderful spirit in that town and then to have those firefighters lost. Perhaps it was their youth, and the families that were suddenly left behind. Perhaps it was the, the helplessness we all feel when ravaged by 
by natural disaster. Because we're still prone to asking why, even though we know there isn't a satisfactory answer supplied either by religion or philosophy or anyone. The disaster also reflected a cost-cutting, inhumane tactic that has grown like a plague around the country. Thirteen of the hotshots were considered part-time, precluding them or their widows from receiving benefits pensions, health care, life insurance. When will we trade in economic expedience for the love of humanity? When? The second time I found tears in my eyes this summer, rather unexpectedly, was following the not guilty verdict of George Zimmerman I can't exactly spell out the reason for my tears that started flowing as though almost a, a reflex action to the decision. But I was reminded of a phrase used by several theologians that described the hum of the universe as sounding in a minor key. What an image. The hum of the universe sounding in a minor key. You know, much like the death of the hotshots, Trayvon Martin's death reminds us of the evils, the evils that still persist and lie beyond human comprehension. There's a troubling sound throughout the universe, or perhaps better said, a cosmic sadness, this inexplicable cosmic sadness that wells up during times of tragedy, loss, and justice. It was an incredible summer for women in many respects. We were introduced to the courageous young woman, Rachel Gentile, who spoke truth to power as a witness to Trayvon. We discovered a state senator from the 10th District of Texas, Wendy Davis, who filibustered for 13 hours to prevent Texas from a highly restrictive abortion law. Man, that woman can talk. She's now thinking of running for governor of the state, but should she fail in that endeavor, I suggest that she might have a great future in ministry. <laughs> 13 hours. We were exposed to racism this summer, not only through the Supreme Court dismantling the Voting Rights Act or the shooting death of Trayvon Martin, but through two women and their ventures in Southern cooking. I learned so much about racism. Dora Charles cooked for the celebrity chef Paula Dean. Remember that news story? Paula claimed that she and Dora were soul sisters, but Dora somehow didn't feel that kinship. Paula's reputation got a little tarnished when her black cook spilled the beans about the recipes that were really hers alone and that she was paid so poorly by Paula Dean that she couldn't afford health insurance despite standing on her feet 15 hours a day. When will we trade in economic expedience for the love of humanity?